Welcome to Catalytic Leadership, the podcast designed to help leaders intentionally grow and thrive. Here is your host, author and leadership and executive coach, Dr. William Attaway. Hey, it's William, and welcome to today's episode of the Catalytic Leadership Podcast. Each week, we tackle a topic related to the field of leadership. My goal is to ensure that you have actionable steps you can take from each episode to grow in your own leadership. Growth doesn't just happen. My goal is to help you become intentional about it. Each week, we spotlight leaders from a variety of fields, organizations, and locations. And my goal is for you to see that leaders can be catalytic no matter where they are or what they lead. I draw inspiration from the stories and journeys of these leaders, and I hear from many of you that you do too. Let's jump in to today's interview. I'm so excited today to have John Rossman on the podcast. John is a leadership and digital transformation expert. He's the author of four books on leadership and business innovation, including the bestseller, The Amazon Way. He's an early Amazon executive who played a key role in launching the Amazon Marketplace business in 2002. Today, he is a leading keynote speaker on leadership for innovation, transformation, and artificial intelligence. He's given over 200 keynotes to worldwide audiences. John is an operator and a builder whose love is diving into business problems and customer needs and designing innovative solutions and business models, creating durable enterprise value. John, I'm so excited you are here. Thanks for being on the show. William, great to see you again, and thank you for inviting me. Thank you for all the work you do. It's it's an honor. I, I would love to start by you sharing some of your story with our listeners, those who are not familiar with you, particularly around your journey and your development as a leader. Yeah, well, that's, that's a lifelong story, really. But, um, you know, I'm an, I'm an engineer by background. And so I think my natural orientation has always been, you know, solve problems, leveraging data processes, data, uh, technology, systems thinking type of approach. And as I got further and further into my career, I was like, that's great, but there's this additional superpower that you can add to that, which is the power of leadership. And I had the opportunity uh, at Amazon to see both of those things combined and had a a prompt from a client of mine to to write uh, the book, the first book, The Amazon Way, and then a few others. And that's where I've really come to appreciate how how leadership can be either the super scaler or the super descaler mm. in terms of you know making change happen and that's that's my business with my clients is is when they have a a, a good business or a great business and they need to make a change want to add a change to that business whether that's innovation or an operating model transition or some type of change and the leadership that you tip your playbook, how you operate as a leader when you are running your operating business is distinctly different than your exploratory, experimental, change related playbook. And people don't understand that. And that's what I try to help them with is both like, what do we do? How do we solve the problem, the strategy of your business? But also like what needs, what twist do you need to add to your leadership in order to be a successful leader for that particular hard problem of creating sometimes dramatic change? Yeah, I think that focus on innovation and transformation is why I've been looking so forward to this conversation. You know, your, your time at Amazon you talk about this in, in your book, The Amazon Way, which if you're watching this on video is over my shoulder here. It's a fascinating and powerful read. I highly recommend that to every one of our listeners. Your time at Amazon really was, was not just up and to the right. It wasn't smooth sailing. Now, I've been a, a customer of Amazon since the late 90s, since 98. So I've, I've, been, I've been around for a minute. I've watched some of that from a customer view. You saw it from the executive table. Yeah, yeah, I would describe, you know, nothing about about the experiences as as up and to the right con- consistently. Um, 
it, it's kind of like a duck on water, right? Like what you see from the outside world, like looks just amazing. What happens underneath the water is everybody's just paddling and scrambling as, as, as hard as possible. And it, it's messy. And, um, you know, one of the things I give Bezos and Amazon a ton of credit to is they operated with the same mindset, um, principles, orientation in kind of the, the down times when, you know, you were being doubted as they did, you know, when business is booming, you know, and everything. And, and I think that, that those are the times that really test uh, leadership. Mm -hmm. And so I was there early. I got to see, you know, we were, we were hammering out these leadership principles. So there's 16 leadership principles at Amazon. They were codified after I left. But we were hammering out like, well, how do we make decisions? How do we prioritize? How do we hold each other accountable? Uh, what do we think is the, are the, the distinct different keys for our business and for our culture that's going to help scale our business across all of our leaders? And that was really the, the essence of where those leadership principles uh, came from. And I never prescribed to anybody like, hey, these are the right leadership principles for you. but just taking the thoughtful time of answering those questions, like how do we prioritize? How do we hold each other accountable? What do we think is different about our culture that needs to be pronounced? Thinking through those things is a healthy thing for any business. And if you can codify them, make them real in the business, that can be the type of supercharger to help mm -hmm. scale your business and, and create consistency in leadership and culture. What was it like for you working for Jeff Bezos? Yeah, so I don't I didn't work directly for Jeff, but I I launched the marketplace business and for the first 2 years it was a weekly meeting with Jeff and and we did I did get to do a bit of travel with him, you know, and everything. It was it was it was fantastic and it was demanding and it was hard and it was everything that you would expect a high performing uh, leader like Jeff would make it uh, and everything. And, and, you know, he had high expectations for us. And I would, I would say, of course, you know, that's what that's, we were trying to change the world and do it really quick and had a ton of constraints and the race was on and we were supposed to be senior leaders within the organization. So it was demanding, but he was, he was great to work with. He was clear, he was consistent Mm -hmm. um, he made you both think big, but understand the details of your business. He was thinking both long term, but he was also like demanding, you know, short term results. And uh, it was high energy and he was all in. Um, and so, you know, I, I thought it was a fascinating uh, place to, to get to be. And I, and I feel lucky to. Um, I You know, I'd been a partner at Arthur Anderson before Amazon and and. I just feel like I got to go to the super graduate school of, of kind of, you know, operations and strategy and, and transformation when I was at Amazon. I love that. The super graduate school. That's excellent. That is so often. What, what whatever happens. is above a PhD. You right. Know, exactly. Right. <laughs> that's a, that's a perfect descriptor. I think of those type of intensive environments. You know, when I was preparing for this interview, John, I, I, I ran across something that you said that you you describe yourself as being unsatisfied with the status quo. This is why you work so much on innovation and transformation. Was that birthed during your time at Amazon? Is that no, no that? I, 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 I think that is kind of a, a little bit of a natural thing, but I got to recognize why that's a superpower, why that's a healthy thing and and to lean into it a little bit and 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 that was why i was a good fit for amazon is like you know it's like yeah thing you know one one of the great quotes i remember from 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 jeff and he was lecturing myself and another colleague and he it was like you know it uh good leaders recognize the difference between simple things things that should be simple and things that should be hard and they only mm -hmm. let truly hard things become hard things in the business simple things should be simple right mm -hmm. and that's true for both you know customer experiences yeah. as well as inside of a business and i think that that framing really gave me like oh okay now here's why some things 
are frustrating to me is because inherently I know this should be a simple thing, but for some reason uh, it's a difficult thing. And that's where you can draw a ton of inspiration for how to improve, how to innovate. It's fascinating. Your experience doesn't just stop at Amazon. I mean, you mentioned Arthur Anderson. You've been a senior innovation advisor at T-Mobile. You've been a senior technology advisor at the Gates Foundation. Like, what was it? What was it like in each one of these? Can you describe the the cultural similarities or differences? Where where did you bring that version of yourself that is unsatisfied with the status quo, always looking for a way to make it better? Right, right. Each one of those distinctly different missions, organizations, um, sure, uh, culture, uh, and everything. And I, and I think I've always serve clients. Even when I was at Amazon, even though I was an operational leader, I also had clients. I, I ran third-party sellers. They were clients. And I also ran a business called Enterprise Service. So we ran e-commerce operations for Target and Toys R Us and a bunch of other oh, great wow. brands, you know, and everything, right? And so I think one of, when, when you are in the service of others, when you are, provide professional services, um, it's always your job to, you know, understand the situation and to figure out, well, where do a, you know, what what do I think that the challenge or the problem is? What do I then? What do I, you know, that's the diagnosis. And then, where do I think we need to go to? And how do we get there? That's the prescription. Mm -hmm. And then, how do I play a role in that? Right. And so you're always, you know, asking like, how do I bring value to this situation? And in each one of those, I got to bring a different. Um, value equation. Sometimes it was as a team, sometimes it was as an individual advisor. And the thing that took, you know, and this is kind of my journey on these books and everything is like, I found the power of taking the little anecdotes and strategies, mostly from Amazon, but not exclusively from Amazon. Amazon. And how do you insert those into a situation to not just solve the problem or the situation that's in front, but yeah. slow it down and go, Hey, how are we thinking about this? Right. Mm -hmm. And so, um, and that's, that's when you can recognize the opportunities to say, let's just take a little time out and think about how we're thinking about this. That's when you can really then nudge leadership in a, in a new direction and kind of give them a new tool that they can use and like just adjust the grip a little bit and 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 put them on a on a different plane and slow them down just a little bit so often especially with senior leaders it it's just um a a, a a a rotating you know wheel of activity and demands and if you can find a space and, and a good moment to slow them down and go ah you know like here's a, here's a new trick to get a different type of result then you both solve the problem and you give them a new leadership twist that they can leverage. I think that's brilliant. You're, you're teaching them a different perspective, helping them to zoom out. And that will serve them not just, like you said, not just in that moment for that particular problem, but it serves them going forward, not just them, but the people that they lead. I love that. That, that you know that that's my goal is both provide, you know, short-term value as well, well as, you know, long-term uh, lasting impact in, you know, whether it's operationally or from an innovation standpoint or some other aspect of, you know, leadership and culture, you know, leave some lasting impact. When it comes to innovation and when it comes to transformation, I mean, I saw a stat that said over 70% of all digital transformation and innovation programs fail. Why are they so hard? Why is innovation and transformation so hard? And are there things that leaders can do to help them to succeed? Yeah. Well, th this is my wheelhouse. This is this is what this is the underlying essential situation and problem that uh, that I've become a real student of. And um, they do. They 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 fail, and they primarily fail to. You know, people think of it as time and scope and budget, and yes, they fail in those ways. But more importantly. They fail to deliver the value in the promise of why we did them in the first place. And then the second killer failure that these things lead to is they make leaders less oriented towards, well, we'll do, we'll try that again. We'll do something more. Right. And so they take, they take less swings 
going forward. And mm. as you know, I don't know if you ever heard this story, but you know, apparent supposedly Babe Ruth, you know, he was not only the home run king, but he was the strikeout king too, right? And That's right. And some reporter was kind of jabbing at him, like, oh, why do you strike out so much? And it's like, you, you know, you can't hit the ball if you don't swing the bat, right? And that's that's the biggest mistake most companies wait, m- companies of scale make is not taking enough attempts at doing new things. Now, the key to that is you got to make those attempts really affordable, right? You have to, you have to understand that this is where, this is the heart of why innovation is different than operations. Operations, you should be 90% successful and 10% failure. When you're innovating, you always start with failure and then you, you maybe iterate your way to success on an idea, but it's definitely a portfolio, right? One out of 10, two out of 10 ideas are going to be the big ideas. And so you 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 have to make those ideas ex- affordable experiments. And that's where, you know, so companies don't understand how to make things truly affordable. They don't understand the nature of the game that, that's different. And so, you know, I've I've really worked hard at like, well, how do you how do you change that equation? What are the interrupts, the things you can do differently in order to change that? Well, as it turns out, there's not one thing, right? If there's one thing, it wouldn't be a, a, a tricky situation. It wouldn't be a wicked situation. It's a com- combination of factors, some of which I've already talked about. Yeah. In particular, one of the things that companies don't do is they're really good about complaining about the current state, right? This is what's wrong with today, you know, either the customer experience or our products or services or, you know, how things happen. What we aren't good at is we paint a vague picture of what the future is, but we can't, we don't take the time or the effort to really go, well, no, write me a story. Tell me, Mm -hmm. tell me it so I could feel what the experience should be in the future. And so if you can take if you can really take the time to create the clarity of your hypothesis, what you believe the future would be, and then guess what? Maybe write two or three versions of that same thing. So they're the they're addressing the same situation, but they they approach things maybe differently. Then we can have a really subtle conversation on what well. Why is A better than B? What would have to be true about C for it to be the best path to go through? Then you can pick the best way to proceed with so much better clarity and team communication around, well, here's where we're going, right? You're not there yet. You you have to just paint a really crystal clear vision of what the future is so that you can all proceed as quickly and and cheaply as possible to test your hypothesis about that future state. So, you know, there's a bunch of tricks to doing that. Underneath all of it is is writing. So writing is a real superpower. That's something from Amazon. They talk about narratives and future press releases and, you know, these different mechanisms. But that habit of writing and debating is the, the, the best method I've come across to re- in most business c- circumstances to really slow us down deeply understand the problem but as importantly or more importantly deeply understand what we think the future is like what's the mm-hmm. future experience and then debate those things well guess what that actually is that's experimenting right there yeah. that's experimenting yeah and people don't recognize that that's actual progress and they mm-hmm. just they just want to get going they just want to start you know, deploying resources, building technology, you know, having their agile methodology and everything. It's like, nope, slow down just a little bit to, yeah. to, to take the time to, to pressure test these things up front and you will be so much better. But it doesn't even stop there, right? Even if you do those things, then there's still a number of other root cause problems of why these transformations fail. And so I, I will talk a little bit about my next book, but that book, uh, it's called Big Bet Leadership, is specifically designed to address the failure points of why these transformations or innovation programs or operating model redesigns, why they fail, and more importantly, what senior leaders can do to address that point of failure. That is, that's so 
so insightful. I, I talk a lot about evaluation, John. I think evaluation is something that, that most leaders understand the value of. There's this idea that experience makes you better. I don't buy that for a minute. I think evaluated experience makes you better. And so mm. the, the questions that you ask truly matter. A mentor of mine says it this way. He says, you have to learn to autopsy success as well as failure. Oh, yeah. I love because, that. Because if you don't know why it's working when it's working, you will not know how to fix it when it breaks. Right. What you're describing really, I think, encapsulates so much of the importance of evaluation as you're experimenting and understanding that failure is part of the process. Right. You can't walk in and say, hey, we got to get it going. What they really mean is, why don't we get the success going the way I envision it? Why don't we see everything up and to the right all the time? You're probably much more of an expert on this concept than I am, but this concept of resulting, right? Yes, um, yes. Uh, and, and correct my terms uh, and everything, but uh, there was a really good book called Thinking and Bets. This is the yeah. core message from that book, which is don't when you're in a betting situation, which is what you're in when you're mm -hmm. in a innovation portfolio uh, thinking big um, playbook, you, you have to separate out the results you get from, did I do things the right way? Yes. Um, and so yes. a lot of what I have to work with my clients on is separating, hey, we have if we go about things the right way, mm -hmm. um, we will over time get the right results. But yes. don't either read too much in short term to either the successes we have or the failures. Focus on the inputs, the controllable inputs. Yes. We'll get to the outputs if we go about our work and our leadership the right way. I know it. I guarantee it. 100%. You mentioned your new book that's coming out in February, Big Bet Leadership. Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah. So uh, name of the book is Big Bet Leadership, your transformation playbook for winning in the hyper digital era. Um, my co-author was my client at T-Mobile. So you'd mentioned oh, I got wow. to be the, the senior innovation advisor at T-Mobile. Kevin ran the strategy organization. We together, we got to stand up a new business incubation um, capability within T-Mobile. And that's where I worked with Kevin and, you know, we took a lot of the the things from, you know, think like Amazon in the Amazon way and that process. And we we, we kind of decomposed them and we made them into T-Mobile's model. And so Kevin and I, you know, I moved on, Kevin moved on. And I was thinking about like, oh, you know, that what's the next book and everything. And um, I, I finally got this framing right around like, oh, really? Like all of these types of initiatives digital transformations, innovation portfolios, operating models, mergers, new product launches, all of those things are big bets. We think they have high potential, but we know that they have material risk to them, right? Mm, mm, they're mm. big, they're bets. There's yeah. no guarantee on these things. And as you pointed out, the vast majority of these things fail. Yeah. Why do they fail and what tools and approaches can we give to senior leadership mm -hmm. to help avoid those failures? And that's that's the goal of the book is to give senior leaders, CEOs, boards, executive presidents, specific insights into why things fail, kind of a, a principle or a policy on like what you do, and then a, a tool or a practical technique in order to avoid it. And we've talked about a few things here, especially around kind of clarity and defining the future state and writing those things out and debating it. But that's just the start of the playbook that we outlined. And so um, that's what the new book is. It'll It releases in February of 2024. And um, I think it's got a, a very unique and provocative point of view on a lot of the things you do in big program project management are absolutely the wrong thing to do when the, when the initiative has significant concept risk to it. And so you need a different playbook because otherwise you will be in the 75 to 90% failure rate that all of these big initiatives have. That's fascinating. You know, the metric that we use to measure success or failure matters. And if we're using the wrong yardstick. And here's what happens at, at companies is they, they think success or failure is 
launching and launching on time and close to budget. <laughs> yeah. That's the start. That's yeah. I would go like, that's good. But really the success metric is your ambition. Mm-hmm. And that's why, that's why we named the, the book winning in the hyper digital era. We didn't talk about like not failing in the hyper digital era. We talked about <laughs> winning and to win, you actually have to create value, right? As a, yeah. as a, as a business. And so what happens is, we start off with a grand ambition, but then because of a number of, of, of governance reasons and, and, and incentive reasons and process reasons and bureaucratic reasons, we compress the situation down into plain small ball, right? Yep. Just don't let it fail. Forget about the ambition, forget about changing the world, forget about all these things. We just have to launch, you know, on time, on budget, you know, and and everything. And it's like, if, and that's considered success, right? Well, that, that really isn't success. We didn't do it at speed. We didn't, we didn't get feedback from the market. We don't know whether it's really going to have the impact, but, you know, the operational leaders can say, yeah, you know, it kind of launched. And that's that's as good as it gets in most cases, right? Mm-hmm. And so um, I just think the entire mindset when we are truly trying to do something that has high potential impact to the business, but has high degrees of risk, you need a completely different playbook. And that's what Big Bet Leadership delivers. You know, that, that feels a lot like the difference in what so many have called the difference in, in management and leadership. I mean, did it launch? Did it launch on budget? You know, did it hit these particular things? That's Those are management questions. What you're describing is so much bigger. It has to do with the impact, the influence. What is the what is the potential? Those are leadership questions. I've always struggled with kind of this subtle difference between leadership and management, and, and I won't debate or, or try to put my point of view on that. All I would add is, both of those have to be oriented to the mission you're trying yes. to accomplish. And yes. so when the mission is to create change and to create value, you can't use your management or your leadership playbook that you use to operate your existing business. You can't use those same things when we are trying to change the business. Here's mm-hmm. a good example, right? And this would be more of a management thing than a leadership team, but but it, it, it presses on leadership too, right? So um, most companies, you know, you, you set up this innovation team or this change team and everything and like, hey, you're empowered to get this thing done, right? And so great. Oh, all of a sudden we need an expert that, you know, it could be a technical expert. It could be a thought topic expert and everything. It's like, then what do you have to do? It grinds to a halt because you have to use the existing HR policies, the mm. existing vendor policies, the exist, existing procurement policies. And all of a sudden, it go, three months go by to bring a, an expert in to help execute your project. Well, mm. You, you need you need com- a completely different playbook for because you are you are trying to optimize for something different in your scaled business. You're trying to optimize for cost per unit. Uh, you're trying to optimize for kind of scaled enterprise risk parameters and everything. Well, when we're experimenting, we're trying to optimize for speed, speed to learning. It's a completely different optimization formula. And so, what you need to do is explain to those functional leaders, get everybody on board. Like we are going to operate with a different tone, tempo, and set of policies here. And if you don't do those, those kind of supporting elements, no matter how good your innovation team is, no matter, you know, uh, and things like that, they're likely going to suffer from the hard constraints that your existing policies and environment put, uh, put on top of them. John, we talk about innovation. We talk about this this technological transformation that is happening in our world, and artificial intelligence is a piece of that. I read in the in your introduction that that you are a leading speaker and thought leader, not just on innovation and transformation, but also on artificial intelligence. A lot of the people who are listening are, are seeing tools like ChatGPT and generative AI as as tools, but are they also threats? Are they also like, what, what does this look like? How should leaders and companies look to create value 
with these tools? The, the key thing is that it's a tool. Uh, and mm -hmm. and uh, the key thing any business person needs to get good at and can add value by is understanding the use case. What problem do I want to solve? And, and mm -hmm. guess what? How do I envision the future being better? And then your experts can go, well, here's a, a variety of ways that we can use to get from here to there with AI now being, you know, kind of a, a, a super tool to, to do things that we literally couldn't do before the launch of ChatGPT. You have to understand the limitations of fundamental limitations of generative AI. It is really good at inference, like the next best logical step. It's not good at deterministic optimization, like how many units should I order or things like that. There's different algorithms for that. And so I think it's so much easier to start with the problem and work backwards, like what's the best way to solve these problems? But you do need to be aware of all the tools that you have at your hands in order to solve the problem in a unique and fast manner to do that. So the encouragement that I have for my clients when it comes to AI is, is um, a, por a portfolio, right? And that portfolio early on should have two recognizable, easy, containable use cases where we think AI and maybe some other tools could could help us uh, get some footing, get some success under our uh, under under our belt and demonstrate some power to it, right? And so that might be something in, hmm. in marketing or technical development or you know something like that, but very functional, very contained, very low risk in terms of experimental. But then in parallel, be thinking about two longer processes, two things that are more end-to-end -end in nature, that are more transformative, and be doing the same exercise, which is, hey, what's fundamentally doesn't work about this? How would we raise the bar in terms of the the output, the the cost model, the fundamental service that's being provided here, and and think about how would we re-engineer and fundamentally um, redefine what this process is, and then apply technology to it. And so, and in that way, like you're starting to build organizational capacity in knowing how to go about this. Um, and exploring and trying to find value through it. But you just have to understand again, back to some of the basics we've talked about, it's a portfolio, things are gonna fail, things are gonna win. Don't don't confuse inputs versus outputs, you know, really focus on how we're going about doing this versus like creating quick wins. So good, so practical. And I hope every leader listening is taking notes on that because I hear so many people confusing those things. That is so helpful, John. Right, let me ask you, how do you stay on top of your game? How do you level up with new skills, new information, new knowledge that you need all the time? Like, what is your process for doing that? Well, I think that long form content um, is critically different and critically more important than short term or, or short form mm -hmm. uh, sound bite oriented content. And so the way I stay on top is I read a lot. I listen to books a lot and I listen to podcasts a lot where they really get to open up a topic like this and you get the benefit of, of an expert on their topic. Yes. And so whether it's books or long form podcasts, that's how I stay um, curious, really, and 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 learn new things and new framing and 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 new tools and new language relative to to doing things. And so, I've I, I, I a couple of years ago I I went through what I called my dietary cleanup, uh, my content dietary cleanup, and I kind of <laughs> got. I got rid of all the junk food that was in my content uh, diet and. I started to focus more on like quality inputs, you know, and everything. And so that's how, that's how I um, do it. And, and a bunch of it's early in the morning when I'm working out, I listen to a lot of things. And then um, I just, I just, you know, tend to read uh, quite a bit kind of at night and that's how I stay on top of it. And, and it, 
it it's work at times, but it's also like I know when I'm highly engaged in something, I can feel the pull of yeah. of a really good book and new material and a really good expert on something, and and it's just it's just easy because it because you know underneath it all, I'm I'm curious about you know fast learning from experts. I love that you brought curiosity out there several times. I think that is an underrated leadership superpower. Is there ever a time when you feel your curiosity start to flag? Yeah, if I'm under uh, pressure, yeah, right. Uh, sh- uh, short term, short termism in general is what you know forces you to like you know, okay, got to contract, make everything transactional, everything tactical, and it and at times that's just that's good. It's reality and you have to recognize it uh, and stuff, but you just don't want to exist solely in that zone for long, especially, you know, and it's really recognizing like, what's your job. And I think what so many senior leaders, um, my, my, my partner, Kevin McCaffrey, my co-author, he, he talks about the CEO agenda, right? Mm -hmm. And um, the CEO agenda is really where the the senior leader puts their time, their attention. And if you can take that CEO agenda and shape it so that 90% of their effort is not for this quarter's results, but shift the percentage, right? So that 25 to 50% of their time and attention is to next year's business or two years business. That's how great businesses are built. Having a team that is capable of delivering today's business and results and all the systems and habits and and capabilities in place. And then having the right CEO agenda, their time and attention focused on the future. But what happens again, at most companies is the senior team is completely absorbed into today's business and they delegate, you know, oh, my innovation team or my management consultant, you know, they're figuring out the future. It's like, are you kidding me? You, you, that your job is the long-term viability and excellence of this organization. And you're delegating your job to others. And, and when, when I frame things in that way, you know, I either get fired or the senior leader goes, yep, I got to change, you know, my CEO agenda here. And that's what we focus on is literally going through their calendar and their, their operational rhythm. And we're going to take a bunch of things off by delegating, by creating forcing functions and OKRs and upgrading their leadership team. And then with the now freed capacity we are going to figure out how to deploy that capacity in the best way possible to creating tomorrow's future great business. The one thing a leader can't delegate. You know, I, I, I'm always open for pushback and debate and questions, but I rarely get it on that topic, you know, and everything, yeah. right? Like, I, I love that. I love that. So often, you're exactly right. I hear leaders all the time. Well, that's their job. I've handed that off to them. I had to there are certain things you cannot do that with. And, and they typically and they, they typically say it's vital. They right, you know, right. innovation, you know, this initiative, or they say it's vital. But if, if you go where their attention is, where they're spending yes. time, where they're curious yeah. and really participating, you know, what did I t- say about you know working with Bezos? Right, he was like part of the team. He was he was working on solving the problem. Um, they don't spend their time there. What they want, what they get typically is a once a week, you know, readout status meeting, everything, right? Like they're not adding value uh, in those types of meetings and everything. Right. Um, They can maybe help you out on one topic, but they're not deeply involved in solving the Mm -hmm. problem that this strategy is trying to solve. You're not getting the benefit of why they're the CEO or president. Um, And you're not getting their understanding to the subtle things that need to happen in order for this to win or to lose. Mm. And so, you know, you're truly not getting the best out of them. So good. I want to take you back. I want to take you back to you at 20 years old. Okay. If you could go back 
and tell that 20 year old version of you one thing based on what you know now, what would you love to go back and tell yourself? Um, it, well, it's kind of the advice I give to my two boys, which are right in that age zone and everything, which is um, chase hard problems, which I did, but bet on yourself, like play mm-hmm. confidently. Don't, don't play small ball. Don't, 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 don't worry about, you know, your job and everything. There's always going to be jobs. If you are adding value and you know how to solve hard problems, there's always going to be a great market, a great role. So, so bet on yourself early and don't, don't be so concerned about, you know, your job, your title, you know, keeping or losing that job. That's, that would be my advice to to myself uh, when I was 20 years old. Solid advice. You mentioned that you like to read and that reading and, and the inputs that you put into your life, that really is one of the ways you stay sharp and stay on top of your game. Is is there yep. a book that you would say, hey, this book has really contributed in a big way to who I am today? This is a book I would recommend that any leader read that would add value to them. There's a, a slew, but one of the classics is Peter Drucker's effective executive. Um, And, you know, he starts off the start of the book is like eight things a senior leader does. And it's like, boom, 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 you know, and everything. Right. (laughs) You you know, starting with they ask, what does the business need? That's the number one thing an executive leader does. So that that book is a timeless classic. Um, Zero to one by Peter Thiel, I think, is a very good a set of, you know, how to think about thinking when yeah. it comes to to innovating and creating new markets. And so that's that's kind of one of my um, favorites. And then there's a business professor from Toronto, Roger Martin, who's written a bunch of really good books. Um, a New Way of Thinking was his most recent one. And he takes on like 15 topics that go on in business and he was like, "Hey, here's an alternate way to think about this." And it's yeah. it's a really good book about thinking. So those are those are a few. But um, it, it, the 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 thing I would say is like, if you only got one book, you, you, you like, oh, you need to to broaden your horizons because there's there's never one perspective or one tool or one approach because circumstances come in such subtle differences and 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 it's the people it's the circumstances it's the history it's it's where you need to get to and so the more perspectives and the more tools that you can bring to the table that's what's going to make you a great problem solver and and give you the wisdom that it takes to to solve these problems mm, why would you limit yourself in your knowledge and understanding in solving problems. Right. Love that. Yeah. You don't have to accept them all, you know, and everything, of course, right? Of um, course. But, but even when you reject the fundamental premise of something, you're, you're a better thinker. Yes. I talk about that as, as learning to eat the fish and leave the bones. There's, there's almost always fish. Right. Sometimes there's more than others, but learning to discern the difference and understanding right. what you can take and apply. That's... Yep. That's something every leader needs to learn. I agree. John, if, if people walk away from this episode with one idea, as so often we do from a podcast like this, what is the one idea you would like for them to walk away with? Well, um, think uh, it would be the one idea. <laughs> That's <laughs> um, great. But, 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 but um, one area I always start with my clients on is is because I, 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 I'll learn so much that it always adds value. And then it kind of starts the exploration process is um, how you measure both short-term results and how you think about measuring long-term results in your business. So the way metrics are used and tying those metrics to true customer experience metrics and, and having a balanced playbook of your metrics. And what I mean by that is not just financial metrics, but a balanced scorecard that shows you both the input metrics as well as the output metrics that you're describing, just slowing down to think about how we measure the business or what what is really important to measure. That will, that will be 
in some cases, a really fundamental shift in, in management. I know our listeners are going to want to stay connected with you and continue learning from you and hear more about this upcoming book. Well, what's the best way for people to do that? So I've got two things uh, to say this. First is Big Bet Leadership launches February 27th, 2024. Go to bigbetleadership.com. I'm going to do a, a drawing uh, for this podcast. So give me you know, your name, Kindle email address, the podcast that you're listening to, Catalyst Leader, and I'll do a drawing close to the book launch. And all I ask is that you write a review for the book. It's a request, not a not a deal, but a re request. So that's one way. And then the second is just, you know, either rossmanpartners.com or uh, John Rossman on LinkedIn is probably the easiest. John, thank you for the generosity that you have shown today in sharing so much wisdom and so many insights from your journey so far. Well, thanks for the conversation, your preparation and sharing your platform with me. And I hope we, uh, we get to do some good work out there together. Thanks for joining me for this episode today. As we wrap up, I'd love for you to do two things. First, subscribe to this podcast so you don't miss an episode. And if you find value here, I'd love it if you would rate it and review it. That really does make a difference in helping other people to discover this podcast. Second, if you don't have a copy of my newest book, Catalytic Leadership, I'd love to put a copy in your hands. If you go to catalyticleadershipbook.com, you can get a copy for free. Just pay the shipping so I can get it to you and we'll get one right out. My goal is to put this into the hands of as many leaders as possible. This book captures principles that I've learned in 20 plus years of coaching leaders in the entrepreneurial space, in business, government, nonprofits, education, and the local church. You can also connect with me on LinkedIn to keep up with what I'm currently learning and thinking about. And if you're ready to take a next step with a coach to help you intentionally grow and thrive as a leader, I'd be honored to help you. Just go to catalyticleadership.net to book a call with me. Stay tuned for our next episode next week. Until then, as always, leaders, choose to be catalytic. Thanks for listening to Catalytic Leadership with Dr. William Attaway. Be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts so you don't miss the next episode. Want more? Go to catalyticleadership.net.